we've allowed the cancer of relativism to infect us, so we think there are no shared universal values, and there is no freedom without those shared universals. Feit is iets wat je niet kan waarderen wanneer je het helemaal hebt. Je moet het een tijdje niet hebben en dan pas begrijpen je wat je mist. Reverse the question: Can art destroy the world? And I think it can. You can choose either to be abused or not. The political abuse is worldwide. The safety of journalists. We hacked into the audience, and then all of a sudden, 300 phones would ring. You know. Welcome to the Bali. Uh, my name is Luzewis van der Laan. I'll tell you in a minute why I happen to be, have the honor to moderate this evening, but I wanted to find out a little bit what your connection is with Poland. Why on earth would you spend a Tuesday night talking about democracy in Poland when you could be just in the other room watching a wonderful movie at the, at the film festival? How many people here are Polish or of Polish origin, have some connection to, to Poland? Ah, I see, there we go. Um, how many of you were in the afternoon session, the kind of the academics getting together, trying to analyze the system? Right? Um, are, are there, is there anybody here who has absolutely nothing to do with Poland? <laughs> <laughs> this is just, uh, just, just fascinating. So what I want to, I want to know, I want to know why would you, why are you interested in coming? Can I come to you because you raised your hand? Yeah, yeah. What's your name? Richard de Waard. Yeah, and why did I'm you Bart. decide to come here? Uh, oh, I was triggered by. Uh, Oh dear. Um, <laughs> well, um, first of all, uh, I'm interested in what what I what makes them tick. What what's the reason for all these things happening? And obviously, I think it has to do with immigration. But I want to find out tonight uh, what is really behind this, and if, for instance, the U United States of Europe to be or the U European U Union would have uh, strong external borders, and everything is solved there. If at then all of a sudden the Polish would say, okay, we, 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 we will be democratic as we also have always been. Fantastic question. Okay, we're going to save that one for the, for the question and answer session. So, um, so it's really wonderful that you're all here. Um, so I'm, I'm going to, maybe we can go to the next slide and I can explain a little bit what my association is with, uh, with Poland. I mean, as a good Dutch girl, I grew up with all the stories of my grandfather and my parents telling me that it was the Poles who liberated us. The, it was the Polish airmen fighting in the Battle of Britain is the reason that we in Holland are, are free today. Can I have the next slide? Sophie? <laughs> She's already on Twitter, you know, getting the debate going, so. Uh, you all know, of course, about uh, um, the way it happened to Polish history, that it was Poland that was the reason that we have uh, united Europe today, because that's where the revolution started. And I remember, of course, in 1989, I think everybody who's old enough remembers when, where they were when the wall uh, came down. And in 1994, when Poland applied for EU membership, I had the privilege of working at the European Commission, and I was asked to join the team of Commissioner van der Broek that did the enlargement uh, negotiations. And then later, I joined the European Parliament and the Dutch Parliament, and I was able to vote on the accession of Poland to the European Union. So I feel like I'm, I've been kind of closely involved um, in this process. And there were a couple of questions that we asked uh, when countries um, that were former Soviet countries or former um, uh, under, under the Soviet bloc applied to the European Union. And one was that what kind of institutions do they need, what kind of laws do they need to make sure that the transition to democracy is permanent, that there can be no slide back? Did we get that right? This is gonna be one of the key questions for tonight. And the other one is, do we as the European Union have a mechanism that when things go wrong, that we can actually intervene. Uh, is the Article 7 pro procedure, which has now, of course, been started for Poland, is that enough? Is that going to, to, to be a solution in one way or, an, or another? And that's, uh, that's one of the questions uh, as well. But without further ado, because I'm here to learn as, as much uh, as us, we have an amazing uh, um, lineup. So we're first going to have three expert speakers, and then we're going to have a panel, and then we'll have room uh, for you um, for questions and answers. So can I ask first Professor Sadorsky to come and to give us an introduction? I think you need no introduction yourself. 
Do you want to stand? Do you want to sit or stand? Wh whichever is more comfortable for you. Do I have to be very strict on the time, Sophie? No, okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's a great pleasure being here. It's an honor to participate in a panel which is chaired by you. And first of all, I would like to acknowledge and thank to, the, uh, to those uh, people and the organization that made my uh, participation here possible, and that is in particular Access Europe at the University of Amsterdam, and more specifically, Professor Ronald Janse, who is responsible for bringing me here. Now, if I were a Dutch and approached the uh, developments in Poland over the last two years, I think that I would be tempted to have responses of the following type. First of all, I would say, well, okay, we hear all these bad stories coming from Poland, but really it is not that bad. Some of the things which happened there can be and are replicated by the events and developments which also happen in perfectly democratic states. So, okay, so they have minimized the role of the constitutional tribunal, but here in the Netherlands, we don't have a constitutional court at all. You know? Or maybe they have introduced surveillance based on reaction to possible terrorism, but so do many other democratic states. They have introduced very strict control over the influx of refugees, but so many other European uh, states do. So maybe it is not that bad. And the second response would be, well, even if it is bad, there is really nothing that we can do. You know, who are we to tell the Poles how to govern themselves? But even if there are certain things which we can do, say through the European Union, through certain sanctioning process, etc., there is always a risk that what we will do will bring more harm than good. That even if we establish some sanctioning process, it will produce a backlash, which in the end will produce net loss rather than benefit. I think that all these temptations should be resisted. I think that any of these reactions is wrong. And let me start with the first one, the most important, that it is not that bad. It is that bad. What is going on in Poland is not just individual set of actions, each of which may be compared to similar actions in liberal democracies. What matters is that there is a cumulative effect, an aggregate effect of an all-out assault upon the fundamental principles of liberal democracy. It is something that the French would call an attack tous azimuts, and this some of these individual actions is more than each of these actions taken separately. So it basically consists of three types of attacks on the very principles of liberal constitutional democracy as we know it in Europe and which are recognized as prerequisite of membership in the European Union. The first part of the three is an overall systemic and comprehensive dismantling of institutional checks and balances. An attack on the Constitutional Tribunal is just part of it, but it is perhaps the most significant one. What happened is that by the end of 2015, after the presidential and then parliamentary election, Constitutional Tribunal was identified as the main enemy of the so-called sovereign. 
And remember, the sovereign in Poland is the 18% of eligible electorate who voted for the Law and Justice Party, or 36 or 37% of those who actually voted, and which due to eccentricities and iconoclastic character of Polish electoral system was translated into over 51% of seats in the parliament. And that gave the ruling party a so-called legitimacy to fundamentally undermine the Polish constitutional system based on the constitution of 1997. But because contrary to, or in contrast to what happened in Hungary, they didn't have the uh, constitutional majority. They couldn't bring about a, as Viktor Orban called, illiberal constitution. They had to undermine Polish constitutional system by statutes, by single majority in the parliament. So their attack on the constitutional tribunal, which was seen as a possible block or hindrance to their so-called reforms consisted of two stages. First, in 2016, they have introduced a great number of different statutes, so-called correcting the constitutional tribunal. And the end result of it was that the tribunal was virtually paralyzed for the entire 2016, because, because rather than dealing with particular statutes, it had to deal with the statutes concerning itself. And when by the end of 2016, they managed, because of the stepping down of the then president of the Constitutional Tribunal and vice president when they achieved the majority on the tribunal, somehow miraculously they withdrew all their laws which were meant to paralyze the tribunal and they started using the tribunal in which they had a majority as a positive aid to the government. So contrary to the raison d'etre of the tribunal, which has always meant to be a limit upon majoritarian oppression, they used it as a support for the governmental actions meant to restrict the rights of the opposition. And the, uh, tribunal's endorsement of a new law and assembly which gave priority to so-called cyclical assemblies, which de facto meant the assemblies organized for years by, by the law and justice, is a case in point. But the attack on the constitutional tribunal was just one aspect of their attempt of dismantling checks and balances a set of laws regarding the judiciary, so-called ordinary courts, and in particular three laws, two of which were vetoed by the president, and that is the law on those so-called ordinary courts, the law on the Supreme Court, and the law on the National Council of Judiciary, had just one single aim. It had nothing to do with making the system of justice more efficient, judgments more prompt, more just, more fair. All that it was meant to do was to subordinate courts to the executive, to the Ministry of Justice and the Prosecutor General who are now merged into one office. And this is one of the leading politicians of the ruling coalition. And in the same category, we should think about laws, for example, addressed and NGOs, creating an Orwellian sort of center for so-called Institute of Liberty, center for development of civil society, which basically centralized all the grants, all the governmental grants for NGOs, which before were dispensed by different ministries depending on the character of the NGOs which were beneficiaries of it by one single office directly subordinate to prime minister. And the same 
type of attack on the remaining checks and balances was to subordinate public media to the government. And public media were turned on, turned into a sort of propaganda of such a vulgar and primitive character that they would be laughable, if not the case that they have a coverage, territorial coverage, higher than the independent private media, which do not address everyone. So that is the first part of this assault on the liberal democracy in Poland. The second part is an assault on individual rights and a set of laws which could have been passed precisely because of this paralysis and dismantling on constitutional tribunal. Because there was no longer a body, an institution that could scrutinize consistency of the laws with the constitution, then they could adopt a whole series of laws, of which perhaps the most emblematic is in the law of assemblies, which served as a very useful tool of persecuting and discriminating against the non-governmental uh, assemblies and giving priorities to the assemblies, manifestations, demonstrations, which are either organized by the ruling party or by the Catholic Church, which uh, has been in a sort of very cozy relationship with the government since 2015. And the third part of a Polish assault on the fundamental values that the European liberal democracies espouse and endorse is an attack on the very principles of rule of law, legality, and constitutionalism. As I mentioned, because they don't have a major constitutional majority, the modus operandi of the ruling group in Poland has been either to quote unquote amend the constitution by statute, which of course is a perversion of, of, of constitution. Statutes should be subordinate to constitution rather than to change it. But they used it to actually change the constitution. For example, by extinguishing constitutionally determined terms of office of members of the National Council of Judiciary or introducing an unconstitutionally recognized body called the National Media Council, the purpose of which was to undermine a constitutionally designed broadcasting council. But if they didn't do that, which seems to be a slightly more sophisticated way of dealing with the priority of the constitution, they resorted to a simple and primitive breach and violation of the Constitution, of obvious terms of the Constitution. And they breached the Constitution in the morning, in the afternoon, and the evening. So for example, when President of Poland, Andrzej Duda, refused to swear in a properly elected judges of the Constitutional Tribunal, he simply breached the Constitution. And when the government of Poland refused to publish some verdicts or judgments of the Constitutional Tribunal because it arrogated to itself a power to say we judgments have been properly enacted and which are not proper judgments because they didn't like their content. It was just a breach of the Constitution, something that even their idol Mr. Viktor Orban didn't do because he produced the liberal changes in a much more elegant way by changing the constitution for which he claimed a mandate and probably he was right. And because Mr. Jaroslav Kaczynski and Andrzej Duda and all the rest of this group which came to the power, let me remind you, with the 18% of eligible voters didn't have that mandate, they simply decided we can breach the constitution in the morning, in the afternoon, and in the evening. So you have the broad picture. 
this government is not just guilty of some individual violations of what we may call the liberal principles of democracy, which may exist also in France, the Netherlands, or the United States. It is a comprehensive, all-out assault on all the principles of liberal democracy, including institutional checks and balances, individual rights, and the principles of rule of law and constitutions. And I don't mention all the other things which are striking to average polls, such as turning public media into the devices of the most vulgar, I would say, Gebelsian type of propaganda. And I weigh my words uh, cautiously, such as predatory capture of strategically important economic entities in Poland, including an all-out system of patronage and spoils, which leaves various small corruption, true corruption incidents of their predecessors as basically being almost paling into insignificance, converting civil service from the neutral and competence-based body into a set of personnel totally subordinate to the ruling party, and most recently taking initial steps into changing the electoral system, which makes many of us wondering whether the next elections will be really free and fair. And if you want, rather than laughing at that, at that account, to see what Poland may be like in three or four or five years' time, look at Hungary. I mean, Mr. Jarosław Kaczyński promised that there will be Budapest in Warsaw. And the sequence of the events which happened in Poland resembles step by step what Orban did except that he did it in an elegant and, per and pragmatic way, not going into an all-out struggle with the European Union, because his party is part of the EPP, which is a mainstream party, rather than all this, rather than as peace, part of this weirdos of the, what is it called, conservatives and reformers, and because he has, Orban, I mean, at least the possibility of introducing illiberal changes through constitutional means, a benefit that Kaczynski and his acolytes don't have. What are the lessons? Let me, let me move on to my conclusions. What are the lessons of Polish crisis or backsliding? And what can be done about it? Well, the lessons, as far as I can see, are probably two, the main two lessons. One is that a success of populist backsliding lies in a successful bundling of different issues, which uh, Kaczynski managed to identify in Polish collective psyche and to appeal to the worst feelings of Polish society, to the worst emotions, not to something that Poland is famous for, its solidarity, it's uh, empathy to the sufferings, but rather the emotions, which in a sense are stronger, those of fear, hatred of others, and egoism. And the way he played the refugees card is the best, or I should perhaps say the worst example of that strategy. So he bundled together a number of different issues. First, the, the latent xenophobia in Polish political psyche. Secondly, the distaste to the uh, elites, to the establishment. And third, his impatience with liberal constraints upon democratic life. And you know, there is something quite paradoxical about it because one may say, well, but how can you actually mobilize people's hatred of the others, of the immigrants, of the refugees, if there are no refugees? 
brought into Poland? Or secondly, you know, how can you actually uh, bring about hatred to elites if you have been part of the Warsaw elite for the last 25 years? You know, and then how can you actually manage to uh, develop all these feelings of anti-liberal, anti-constitutional impatience if you came to power, you and your president, thanks to that constitution. But he managed to bundle these things together and don't ask me about how logical it is because there is no, not my logic and not much logic and coherence in a populist mindset. So the last question is, what can be done about it? A few days ago, the European Parliament voted on a resolution which is generally seen as a pre-Article 7 procedure. Article 7, which under the first section may I either lead to purely like symbolic determination that there is a risk to values of the European Union, or under sections two and three combined, which may lead to more significant sanctions, namely suspension of the voting rights in the Council. And I think that a choice for the European Union is this. These days, the European Union, under the pressure of a great number of combined crises, including the refugee crisis, and the crisis still related to the global financial crisis, is starting to rethink its future. It must think very, very seriously. Are we simply descending or degenerating into something like a free trade zone? Or are we really a community of values? And if we are a community of values, we have a very clear template in Article 2, which says, what are the values common to the European Union? And they are in particular three, democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. These are the standards by which the applicants to the European Union are scrutinized. But by extension, these are the values which should be applied also to all the members of the European Union. And it's a tragic statement that if Poland were now to be a candidate to the European Union, there is no way that would have been accepted as a member because it violates this Article 2 principles in such a fundamental way. So I would say it is a matter of the very integrity and essence of the European Union that it should make the strongest possible statements about its disapproval of what is going on in Poland. And these statements are not criticism of Poland, because Poland is a bigger thing than the current government of Poland. It is a criticism of the cover common government of Poland, which is guilty of the all-out assault on the fundamental principles of the European Union. And when the Article 7 was considered and then developed in Amsterdam and then in Nice treaties, an idea was, well, maybe it's some sort of nuclear option. Think about this metaphor for a moment. Nuclear weapon acted mainly by its non-use, by its deterrent effect. On the other hand, if everyone knew that nuclear weapon would be never used, it wouldn't have its deterrent effect. And that's exactly the case of the Article 7. So when you ask the question, when you ask yourself the question, so when is the time to use it? I would say, the time is now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You've given us a lot to chew about, um, but in, because of the time, I would like to go immediately to, uh, to Kay Stair, because we have three, of course, uh, speakers. I hope, as part of your opening statement, you will explain to us why on earth a Dutch judge is so concerned with what is happening in Poland, because that fascinates me as well. I will try to answer the question. It's not very difficult. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. 
Um, as uh, the chair told the, you already, I'm a Dutch judge, and I'm um, a member of the Dutch Council for the Judiciary. But I'm also the chair of um, a project uh, among <coughs> the European network of councils of the judiciary. And this project is about independence and accountability. And the network is a European network where all the member states of the European Union are a member of. And um, this evening I will shed my light upon the events in Poland from the point of view of this European network of councils for the judiciary. What did the ENCJ, that network, do in reaction to the changes of the judiciary in Poland? Which framework did the ENCJ use in this regard? The central question of my keynote will be ENCJ standards as a tool for interference in national ju ju judiciaries or an instrument to give guidance to independent judges. I'll start my address with an overview of the role of the ENCJ and its history before saying something on the response of the ENCJ on the developments in Poland. The ENCJ was established in 2004. The idea was to cooperate amongst judiciaries in view of rapid developments within the European Union and because of increasing responsibilities for judges. The Netherlands Council for the Judiciary is one of the founding members of the network and we have always been very active in the network. Former chairman of the Netherlands Council and one of the founding fathers of the ENCJ said that the fact that there is no blueprint for councils for the judiciary makes it imperative to work together and to learn from each other's experiences. Today, this cooperation is still at the core of our network. Each year, the ENCJ organizes multiple working groups on issues in which we as councils want to develop and learn from each other. In recent years, one of the central projects uh, has been the development of the early ENCJ report upon uh, independence and accountability. In 2013, the ENCJ started the ambitious project which aimed to develop indicators for independence and accountability of the justice system of the European Union. The second objective was to present an ENCJ vision on the independence and accountability of the judiciary. Each year, the participating members have to fill out a questionnaire based on these indicators. One of the indicators is on the legal basis of independence of the judiciary. And an, another example is the organizational autonomy of the judiciary. And finally, indicators on disciplinary measures and non-transferability of judges. Another part of the report consists of a survey among all the judges in the European Union. The purpose of this survey is to test the subjective independence of the judiciary, what is the perception among all the judges in the European Union? Do they feel that they are actually independent or is there, uh, is there pressure from uh, the government, or from the media or whatever? The total report gives a good overview of the state of the objective and subjective independence of the judiciary and its accountability. And the next step is to translate the results of these reports into concrete actions within national judiciaries. Where are the vulnerabilities in uh, our systems and what should be done about it? Implementing the report in national reforms is a responsibility of the members of the ENCJ. In the past, the ENCJ left it more uh, to its members to implement the reports. But in last years, the ANCJ started to organize dialogue meetings to, to facilitate the implementation process and to help uh, the other members uh, to, to implement and give them tools to implement. In these meetings, members can share their best practices and address challenges within their judiciaries. The European Commission has taken a special interest in the reports on independence and accountability, and the re results have been translated into the European Union Justice Scoreboard of the European Commission. 
Another one of the recurrent themes within the ENCJ is the working group on ENCJ minimal judicial standards. In this context, standards were developed on the selection, appointment, and promotion of judges, disciplinary measures, allocation of cases, evaluation, and irremovability of judges. The main idea is that these standards can assist councils in their continuous work on the independence of the judiciary. As a judiciary, we have a responsibility towards society to assure an independent, accessible, and professional adjudication of cases. Due to this responsibility, judiciaries should keep up with societal developments and to develop itself continuously. The judiciary is there to protect the rule of law and the rights of, it, of the citizens. At the core of the relationship, with citizens is trust. Trust is not earned by, learn, by leaning back and staying in an ivory tower far away from the daily lives of citizens. It is sometimes, uh, it is something that takes a long time to build and which should be proven to citizens by ensuring an efficient, swift, and accessible judiciary. The standards and principles that ENCJ uh, develops can be used as a safeguard an inspiration for further developments within independent judiciaries. This is a responsibility of the national judiciaries, and as a network, we have a role in being supportive towards the members and the observers. The ENCJ did just that in the case of Poland. The proposed and implemented laws were a direct attack on the independence of the judiciary in Poland and the Polish Council for the Judiciary was given very little time to react to it. Upon the request of the Polish Council for the Judiciary, the network has published several statements on the development in Poland, starting from January this year. In the statement, the network referred to the ANCJ standards and the general principles of the ANCJ, including in particular the independence of the judiciary and the status of councils for the judiciary. What is important here is that the Polish Council asked for cooperation on this field. I think it is essential to underline this, as the European judiciary should be independent and therefore interference or publishing statements should be done very carefully. However, the European judiciaries have also have a direct interest in the developments in Poland. I refer to the statement made by the INCJ in this regard. And I quote, ENCJ reiterates that a key requirement for maintaining and enhancing mutual trust between the judiciary, judicial authorities in the European Union as a basis for mutual recognition is the independence, the quality and efficiency of each of the judicial systems and respect in every state of the rule of law. I would like to add to this that an independent judiciary is fundamental for the development of the European internal market, investment climate, and general wealth. What is interesting to see is that the INCJ standards have been developed within the network as a framework for its members and observers, and that the European Commission has acknowledged these standards in its opinions and recommendations about Poland. I see two developments here. On the one side, we see a change in the role of the INCJ from a network of cooperation exchange uh, of best practices to a supportive network where discussed standards are used as an important framework for national judiciaries. On the other hand, the standards that have been developed over the years by the network are being qualified by the European Commission as being part of European standards of judicial independence. Let me conclude. I strongly believe that as a network, we have a strong responsibility towards our members and observers when the judiciary is under threat. ENCJ fulfilled this responsibility by issuing statements for the safeguard of judicial independence in Poland, and these statements were used by the European Commission in its reports on Poland. For the future, the network will continuously support the independent judiciary in Poland, for we are all European judges 
with a duty to uphold the values of the European Union. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then the third one in our row of speakers is uh, Adam Bodnar, who you all know, of course, as the Polish um, Ombudsman. Please, because I really want to leave some time for uh, the panel. Thanks. It's, yeah, it's a bit limp. It's, um, I don't know what we can do about it. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for inviting me here, uh, especially thanks to Donald Janse, who made it uh, happen. First of all, I would like to, to start with saying um, about the role of the Ombudsman in the Polish, um, the Polish system. Uh, Ombudsman uh, under Polish uh, constitution is a constitutional organ which is responsible for uh, rights and freedoms. Uh, the constitution says that it is a guardian of rights and freedoms, so the Ombudsman receives complaints from uh, citizens but has to undertake a number of actions uh, uh, under the constitution, under the Ombudsman to uh, to refer to those uh, complaints, but also to dangers which are connected with uh, rights and freedoms. And in this context, uh, obviously, uh, two years of my term I started in September 2015 are quite important, uh, also taking into account what was said, uh, said before. I would like to start by saying that the whole crisis uh, concerning the uh, Constitutional Court um, is, in my opinion, only part of the, of the story. because. Looking into my practice, uh, I have a feeling that uh, Polish citizens, in some of the cases, in cases of, I would say, political nature, do not have like a real access to ju judicial review mechanism, to a mechanism that uh, allows them to uh, review the uh, compliance of the legislation adopted by the parliament uh, with, the, uh, with the constitution. So one example is this issue of cyclical assemblies, so assemblies that are organized every uh, on a specific date uh, in order to commemorate some, uh, some events from the past. So one assembly is organized every 10th uh, of every month. And another was the Independence Day, uh, Independence March organized uh, recently on 11th uh, November. But I would say that it is not just a question of whether the, what is the position uh, and independence of the Constitutional Court, but also what happened in the meantime that uh, in the meantime we could observe that some of the other institutions were subject of what I would name a centralization of the state power. And I mean here the Prosecutor General, uh, so merging uh, powers of the Prosecutor General, uh, uh, sorry, the institution of the Prosecutor General with the Ministry of Justice, which, which by itself is not a problem because we had that kind of a tradition before, uh, before 2009. But in addition, the Prosecutor General has gained some number of individual competences to interfere with different kinds of proceedings. And by, uh, on the virtue, on the, uh, on the basis of the law and organization of common courts, it has also the power to dismiss and appoint presidents of courts without consultations with uh, anybody. It is a question of uh, extension of powers of secret services, uh, reform of uh, public media, uh, but also, um, as I said, reform of the judiciary, especially adoption of the law on organization of common courts. Uh, when it comes to other laws, we are right now in a process of, let's say, discussing uh, reform of the Supreme Court and the National Council of Ju Judiciary. And I would like to say that, in general, I agree with the um, idea that Polish judiciary needs, uh, I would say, more efficiency and more uh, better, better work uh, in terms of its operation, but the question is whether means adopted by the government are uh, well construed and whether they create a danger to the right to independent court uh, under the Constitution. But I would like to say that uh, in addition to all those uh, things that are taking place when it comes to the uh, centralization of power, I would say, like to say that there are number of reforms that are implemented by the government, which I, as the Ombudsman, assess positively. Uh, and, uh, and I must uh, underline that such reforms like a so-called 500 plus program, which is about distributing social benefits to families, uh, giving 500 lots is 120 euros more or less to every second, third, fourth uh, child in a family, is a good thing. And being the Ombudsman, when you see the report that short loan uh, short-term loan companies are suffering from uh, uh, and their uh, economic situation gets worse. I'm, I'm pretty happy with this, that uh, people do not need to take that kind of um, loans, uh, and it was the practice before. What I mean that the, thanks to this program, the 
uh, the level of poverty has uh, decreased in Poland and it is a good effect of this program. Another idea, idea of the social housing. Uh, for years we had this tradition of talking that if you want to have a flat, you must get a job, get a loan, and then you will have a flat. Uh, now the government is promoting the idea of social housing. Uh, digitalization of the, of the government, number of reforms uh, introduced by the Ministry of Digitalization. Even resolving such issues like fathers not pay, paying alimonies. We have a <laughs> fundamental problem that more or less 90% of Polish fathers are not paying their alimonies and there is a need to uh, make things, uh, to, to change those things. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, when the issue of Poland is discussed, sometimes this, uh, this picture is very much one-sided, that, uh, that number of speakers concentrate just on one issue, forgetting that basically the situation is much more complex. And to a certain extent, I sometimes um, understand the, the government that there are a number of ministers who are trying to do their job as much as they can, but on the other hand, uh, they only hear the, uh, the criticism because of those institutional issues. And I would like to understand the, underline that I do not downgrade those institutional issues. I perceive them as extremely important from the point of view of uh, democracy, from the point of view of rights, uh, human rights and, uh, and protection of democratic standards. But uh, I think this we should, we should remember about, about this. When it comes to individual rights and freedoms, especially civil and political rights, uh, I would like to say that what we observe, I would qualify this. I have a problem with this institution of cyclical assemblies and in my opinion, uh, basically it is not a, not a standard in the democratic state. Uh, but apart from this, uh, I would rather say that we observe something what I would name like a chilling effect on freedom of assembly. So, so it does not mean that assemblies are, I don't, I don't know, are prohibited or are uh, banned in Poland. Quite otherwise, you know, in July we had uh, 281 cities where assemblies were taking place in the context of the reform of the, uh, of the judiciary. But on the other hand, you can observe that uh, the authorities are, by making different minor crimes proceedings against some participants in assemblies, are sending something like a chilling effect on the on the exercise of this, uh, of this freedom. Just last week I sent a letter to the head of the police concerning, uh, concerning this. And I would say that this uh, concept of chilling effect it has especially, uh, a special context. It means that not necessarily some rights are violated per se, but the atmosphere that is created by different, sometimes even minor actions, uh, is giving some kind of an effect to, to this. Another example, there was a big protest of women's uh, rights organizations uh, on the 3rd uh, October this year. And on the next day, suddenly, the prosecutor's office with the police appeared in the headquarters of four such organizations. You know, so you ask why uh, they appear just to secure documents concerning some grants that were received from the Ministry of Justice just on, the, on one date and just after uh, after the, the protest on women's rights took, took place. So, so I, I say that, that I think it is, it is quite in, in important to, to look at this from this uh, perspective. In my opinion, there are a number of uh, factors that may influence, I would say, the future, what would happen with Poland in future. Uh, and I would like to enumerate those, uh, those, those factors. First of all, um, Poland is a country with a huge tradition of the solidarity movement. And for a number of leaders of the solidarity movement, the current situation is yet another challenge, yet another historical challenge for them to fight for standards they believe in. And for me, like the, one of the iconic figures of those protests is Professor Adam Strzembosz, who is the former, I would say, the most anti-communist judge, uh, who was one of the drafters of agreements uh, during the round table talks concerning the position of the National Council of, of Judiciary. And he's right now eight years old, and he's one standing man, sometimes standing with the scandal, protesting against reforms of the judiciary. Second point, uh, uh, we should mention the role of the civil society. We do have not only watchdog organizations, but we have strong charity leaders that are uh, protesting against some changes. But also what we observe is a development of new civic movements, such as women's rights groups, movements dealing with free courts, uh, but also movements that are using, I would say, the traditional non-violent protest. Non-violent protest aiming towards achieving some bigger aim. And even today, 
28 Polish uh, NGOs have signed a, a joint petition protesting against uh, judicial reform that are going to start tomorrow uh, in the parliament. The third point I would like to say is the local, uh, our local governments. Uh, if you look uh, from the bird's eye, you can see that local, uh, the reform of local governments is one of the biggest successes of the Polish uh, democracy from 1989. And, um, uh, and right now we are preparing for, for local uh, elections. And uh, it is quite visible that uh, they provide, an, I would say sometimes, alternative and completely different forum for discussing things and approach to, to, to certain things than we have at the central uh, level. I travel a lot of, uh, around Poland. I visited uh, during the first two years of my term more than 100 cities. So, so I see that basically those standards are playing completely different tune when you go locally. The fourth point is a uh, reaction of lawyers. For a number of them, the challenge to human rights uh, standards and to judicial independence standards and, uh, and rule of law standards is a question of their professional responsibility how to react, not only in terms of protesting, not only in terms of uh, representing victims of some violations, but also in terms of how to use some alternative methodologies of working, for example, as a judge. So one of the biggest discussions we are having is that in case of a crisis of the judicial review, to what extent judges should use so-called direct application of the Constitution. So what, to what extent they should directly apply the Constitution or the European Convention on Human Rights and its standards in their daily, uh, daily work. Um, another point is, are, is the interconnection of Poland, I would say, in international networks. So ENCJ was, was quoted as one of the examples, but there are numerous opinions of the OSCE, of uh, different bodies of the Council of Europe, uh, of special rapporteur of the United Nations on judicial independence, of different committees of the United Nations. And I would say that they deliver some arguments, they make, they provide for some assessment of the situation in Poland, but at the same time, in a, I think in the longer term, the, they create something like a safety net. Uh, I hope so, uh, uh, at least, that they are, they are a safety net for uh, sustaining or stopping some of the uh, some of the changes, and the last point, and maybe it's it's one of the most important points, because sometimes the, the Polish discussion is that all the institutions of checks and balances were they installed after July uh, this year. I have doubt because the position of Mr. President is very much unclear. Mr. President, who decided to veto first the law on regional accounting councils. Uh, and I know that it is a quite a strange uh, <laughs> notion, but basically it is the, the body which is controlling the finances of the, of the local governments. And later on, he vetoed two of the laws, the law on the Supreme Court and the law on the National Council of Judiciary, uh, as a result of, most probably, of protests on the streets. It's a question whether Mr. President will be checks and balances mechanisms in this situation or not. We don't know it. Maybe you know, upcoming days we'll give an answer to this question. But uh, but I think it is the, the open the open question. I would like to conclude that uh, first of all, when there is a crisis of judicial review, then traditional legal means have to be supplemented by some other means. And we observe the I would say emergence of other political means of protest. Uh, so it is like for myself. Uh, it is not easy these days to, let's say, challenge laws to the Constitutional Court because uh, with some of the cases, I have a feeling that it will not produce any good uh, result or maybe not, no result at all. And even some of my cases that I challenged last year were not subject of, of uh, review yet. But, but if there are no legal means, then some other political means appear. Uh, using self-organization of the society, using freedom of assembly, freedom of association, freedom of speech, and we can observe that some of the, uh, in some of the situations when this pressure from the society is sufficiently strong, it may work. Uh, of course, it still depends on the will uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of the government uh, to a great extent, but, but still you have a feeling that this question of social support is taken into account. So just to give you an example, uh, in the context of local elections, there was a discussion whether 
we should have a restricted number of terms for mayors uh, to be elected. So, so basically there was an idea that they should be elected only twice, but it should apply retroactively. So if somebody has served already twice, then stop. He cannot, he or she cannot be a candidate any, any longer. And because of the pressure, this uh, idea was, uh, was removed. So, and there are a number of such examples when there were some ideas, some proposals, but then they were removed due to the uh, political and, uh, and social uh, pressure. So, uh, so this thing, so like replacement of legal means with, uh, with political means of pressure, I think it's, it's something that is happening these days. And second, I would say that uh, democracy for sure, in my opinion, is in a very difficult stage in Poland. And it is not clear what is the future, but I do hope that different safety net measures as well as the reaction of the uh, civil society will, uh, uh, will uh, lead to the survival of a democracy in Poland. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, it's a very nice, uh, hopeful note to start the panel on. Can I ask um, Adam Czarnota and um, um, Radoslaw Markowski, I'm sorry about the pronunciation, um, uh, to come on up? And I would love to save a little bit of time also for the, uh, for the audience. Very good. Welcome. Do you want to just sit? Yeah, just go ahead and sit, sit down because we want to make this a little bit more, uh, more interactive. Um, but can I start with Professor Chernota first? So we've had a lot to chew on, uh, a lot of information. What is your assessment of the situation? Can you take the microphone a little bit towards you? Yes, thank you. The question, what is assessment uh, that's why we're asking you, you're a professor, yeah, and uh, right. um, you, can, you can distill it all into something stop succinct. With the, with the, with the <laughs> professorship. Well, uh, <laughs> let's start maybe such way. The, the, the question, here, question here was how to help, right? What is possible to do? I mean, the, is, I'm glad with the question is what could be done, not what has to be done. We just celebrate 100th anniversary of the, of the <laughs> Bolshevik Revolution, and the Lenin, as you know, wrote this what has to be done. So not what has to be done, but what could be done. But what could be done depends from the recognition of the situation. And uh, it happened that I don't share the recognition uh, which was presented by a friend of mine, actually, and a colleague, <laughs> uh, Wojciech Sadurski, here. So why? Why? Maybe let's start maybe with such, such, such point of view that mm, when I travel back, because I don't live in Poland permanently, uh, when I travel back to Poland, then I am I'm from the provinces. It means I am going to my own town. My own town is a very small one, it's just 25,000 inhabitants. What happened after 1990, that <coughs> there were the three big factories, state-owned factories, which were closed down. And the outcome was unemployment. Unemployment, which was about 40% of the, of the working population in this town and a total hope, helplessness for the long, long, long time. So therefore, from my perspective, what is happening now is not that it's a is total change, because the change happened before, but I don't, my assessment is not a tragic one, right? Means I do share with my colleagues here that there was a, what has been called before in our workshop, procedural abuse by the contemporary government. But at the same time, I, my perception of, the, of what is happening in Poland is as a change, as a correction of the liberal abuse of the situation before, after 1989, mm -hmm. 1990. Do you agree? Well, hardly. <laughs> this is all, wonderful when the panel all, disagrees, <coughs> then I don't have to do anything uh, anymore. <laughs> well, the major problem with me is that I live in Poland, you know. <laughs> I would love to fly to Australia, <laughs> in fact, I would even I ask you invite to invite you. me in case I have to fly somewhere, uh, which is very uh, likely. Uh, so first of all about this Polish reality, because these are the subjective things. I truly believe that the, the place you are coming from has encountered unemployment, etc. But if we talk here about Poland and not about a small town in Poland, then the following facts are due. 
if you compare the Polish GDP of 1989 to the one that is in 2015, it is 250% GDP growth. Of course, negligible thing. This GDP is macro thing. Nobody really has the ability to taste it, but it is there. Uh, then in the last eight years of the former government, prior to peace in 2015, during the crisis in European Union, Poland has a 28% of cumulative GDP growth, which is far, far more than the next in row, Slovi Slovakia. Now, and this is accompanied by the following figures. The Gini coefficient about inequalities goes down from 36 to 28. The unemployment rate is down to 5% and inflation is almost zero, right? And of course, there are those places where still there are poor children. Yes, it is a poor country. But on average, if you compare it to the Czech Republic, Hungary, let me remind you, we had a GDP per capita, 60% of the Hungarian GDP per capita in 1989. In 2013, we sort of surpassed the Hungarian GDP per capita and we are more or less on par today. So if you look at the dynamics of the change, I, the, the question that one should be capable of, of answering is what could have been done better than it was because it was not the smart Hungarians. Let me tell you there is this proverbial American saying if you are in a rotating door behind someone and he, uh, he is behind you and he ends in front of you, it should be a Hungarian. A fantastic <laughs> economic community of Kornais and others. Then there are the Czech Republic with this fantastic development in the interwar period, industrial society with middle, uh, true middle classes and democracy in the interwar period. And then there is this Poland with backwarded, extremely backwarded agriculture in 1989 uh, uh, with um, something that is uh, really important, a very backwarded, very obsolete Catholic church, which is not a an actor, an important political actor, but certainly not a democratic one. How, how did we make it? So it, it calls for an explanation. Right? And do you have one? Because if you can't find it in uh, the economy, yeah, where would? Because uh, well, uh, I'm, I'm looking at the know, time. Because you're an academic, you're an academic a yes. Professor, I'll take an hour to. to That's talk why I'm about saying I'm, I'm, I can't but give you an hour. I don't even know. I can yeah, give you five minutes. Uh, so, but what so would be the essence of your analysis? The essence of my analysis would be that those who are criticized, <clears throat> and especially the last eight years in which the cumulative growth in Poland between 2007 and 15 was 28 percent, something that surely I'm jealous. Surely yes. you, you, I see envy in your <laughs> eyes. You know, uh, uh, it has to be explained why this was possible under this liberal nasty cosmopolitans that were allegedly exploiting the true uh, spirit of the Polish people, should I say? Yes. No. Okay. <laughs> so. So if it's, the, not the, the, if it's not the economic this, one, where, where, do, where do we yeah, go? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, what happened in the 2015 election was this absolute skillful narrative. You know, we live in echo chambers and uh, the truly, of course, there, this is a poor country. There were still people excluded. There were all kinds of things that, if you are like myself, appreciating what has been done in the 2007, 2015, there is a big comma. And after this comma, you can clearly say, the health system insurance was malfunctioning. The railroads are not perfect. All kinds of things you can blame on this government that was there in place, but just after a big comma. Otherwise, it was sometimes in the future, in the encyclopedia, you will see that this period was by far one of the most impressive developments in Poland. Yeah. But you and know, as a, can, I, can I interrupt you? Because as a recovering politician, I know better than anyone else that facts, figures, and a healthy economy 
don't actually is not the kind of things that get you know get people's hearts racing and gets them gets them to vote for you. So if the economic story somehow didn't resonate and people want something else, I'd like to go back to you. The economy is obviously part of it, but there's more to the story of why they were able to win the elections, what their appeal, it's about history, it's about culture, it's about identity. Can you tell a little bit, because I, I know that not the whole audience is, is, is Polish here, a little bit more about what happened in that regard. Well, the question is why they, that 2015? That yes, but also now, I mean, uh, because, because it, it's, it's not something that's finished now, eh? this, is, this is ongoing. Well, I think that, that <coughs> that's two reasons, actually, uh, from my point of view, were they important. The first of all is, let's say, the normative one, right? It means what's, what Radek told about the success of the, from the macroeconomical point of view did not translate to the microeconomical point of view, which means there was a lot of people who were excluded from this uh, huge economical success. Because, so to say, that was a, it is, it was and is huge economical success, which means that a lot, of, a lot of people were simply marginalized from the access to resources. But then the second is, uh, is the program, I mean, is uh, my perception from the distance at the time was that the program of the of the Peace and Justice Party was about about the revitalization of the state, actually, which means the state after 1989, the liberal attitudes which were dominated reduced the state to the minimum. And as you know, the, the liberalism, political liberalism, never was about the minimal state, minimal in the intervention to the, in the economy, but the same strong state, a state which is able to, to steer some social processes as well. And uh, after 2015, means what the Peace and Justice Party did were the radical reforms, and described here by my, by my colleagues, and uh, in the positive, negative way, and I partly agree with the negative, partly agree with the positive, but nevertheless, that was what was there was a, uh, bringing back the state apparatus and the ability, actually, to, to reduce this, what was called theoretical state, to the real state, with a state which is able to steer the social processes and also redistribute the access to resources. Yeah, thank you very much. I'd like yeah, to really, just, just yeah, one, I'm going to do that, but then I'm going to go to the yeah, audience. Yeah, just Sorry. one sentence. In Polish history, if anything positive happened, uh, and we enjoy the freedom now to even disagree, is not the state, but the society. The civil society that was capable of showing the finger to the state, be it alien or national, it is currently the state this civil society, the m small and medium enterprises that are effectively contributing to the bloody budget that is redistributed by this state to the ineffective state corporations that are playing the role of a nepotic and clientelistic support for this government. It is us, the citizens, that effectively work in favor of effective economy, paying taxes that through the budget goes to the ineffective state enterprises and all this bullshit about reinventing the state in the economy, the kind of Korean type. We, this is not gonna happen, this is not gonna work. It never worked in Poland, so I'm very pessimistic about the future as well. I would say I would have loved to have this for another hour, but uh, I really want to yeah, go to yeah, the I to the have. audience. No, I no, no. Promise. It's it's not about shutting. So what I would like to do is just I want to collect a number of comments or questions from the audience, and I would like both the panelists and our speakers um, uh, to g have the opportunity to react. First, I would love to know: Is there someone from the Polish government or the embassy who is like really dying to say something? Because um, this is, uh, of course, for for open debate. So um, you'd be very, or if someone from the Vatican. Um, <laughs> Uh, then we, we can do that. Yes, please. I don't know. You don't look like a priest to me. I'm assuming it's the, go the government. I, I'm afraid I'm not going to give you the microphone. I'm going to hold it for you. But please get up. It's, 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 a, it's an old practice. Hi. What's your name? 
Good evening, my name is Marcin Czaperak. Yes, what would you like to? Uh, am I allowed to speak? Of course. Permission granted, ma'am? Absolutely, within Thank time. Thank you very much. Uh, mm, I arrived to, to the Netherlands uh, two months ago uh, in my new capacity as Polish ambassador. Welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, I didn't really get used to this function before I uh, lectured at the Jagiellonian University at the Faculty of Law and Administration. I am junior professor of private international law. So uh, I'm very happy to take part in uh, this debate. I was told by my Dutch friends that the Amsterdam, and I said Amsterdam is the place of encounter of opinions and exchange of of views and uh, debate, so I think the Bali is a good opportunity to start. I'm very thankful for this evening. Uh, uh, well, uh, listening to, to, to distinguished panelists, I make some, some points, uh, uh, but general remark it is debates are good, and it's good to put government on a trial. I think everybody agrees unless it's a fair trial, because everybody has a right to a fair trial and it's a gist of the rule of law, I think. And uh, the idea of fair trial is also uh, equality of arms. And equality of arms, it means you, in order to have debate, you invite people having different backgrounds and different views. And the, the better is con conflicting views. Uh, I haven't seen any government supporter here invited, so I presume uh, it's not something which I recommend. I would rather recommend inviting and giving floor to somebody who is okay. able to speak on behalf of party. I mean, if you, expert, if you expect expert, then expert. Otherwise, you make impression of inner circle, like-minded group rather than debate. Uh, if I'm able to give some comments to, to sure. your uh, uh, lectures or uh, speeches, uh, Professor Sadurski uh, undermined the legitimacy of the governments by saying 18% it's not majority. Well, of course it is not. Nevertheless, we are parliamentarian democracy as it stands in the constitution. I think there is no dispute about that. And the system means, according to the rules of election, who wins is entitled to govern. It's like with the Dutch success with uh, European Medical Agency, there was the same amount of votes for Myland and Amsterdam, and what happened? There was, according to the procedure, lots were drawn. Who won? Amsterdam. Can I undermine that and say, well, the same number of votes? No, well, we agreed on the procedure, and here where we stand. So this has happened in Poland. I don't want to, and I don't have time to explain why. Sure, I'm no, not it's, it's the, it's the system, yes. Well, if, if it's unfair, if you say, what is not only 18%, well, but perhaps, According to the law, it is enough. I mean, these rules were not in dispute before. I, I'm not aware of. So, by the way, uh, congratulations on your uh, EMA success. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I'll, I'll let you maybe one or two more comments because I'd like to go to the rest of the audience as well and yeah, some reaction. So that's yeah. what I, I, I know, I understand. I just <laughs> wanted to contribute to the yeah. debate. No, it's great. But actually, I did it. I bought the ticket. <laughs> <laughs> That's my contribution to, Great. to the debate. Uh, lots of things, uh, the, the assemblies, I mean, this could be clarified, but I perhaps go to to, to, to the distinguished judge uh, who uh, represent, I mean, you acted in uh, uh, as a member of ECAJ. It's a very good uh, to read statistics of ECEJ. Uh, they release the statistics like for last two hours, so uh, we are now, we have, have got available for 2014 and in 2018 we will have for uh, 2016. So if you look like for number of judges for uh, 100,000 of people, you will see that Poland has 
uh, 26 and Netherlands 14. And uh, are we better? And are Polish people better served? Well, actually, unfortunately not. Uh, my dear uh, colleague and honorable uh, ombudsman said, uh, Polish courts need better luck. Well, the whole discussion about judiciary system in Poland should start with the context that this system desperately needed reform. And lots of my colleagues, judges, attorneys, definitely not peace voters, definitely not. They were very, very unhappy with that. Mm -hmm. The judges were frustrated because they could not deliver uh, judgments in a right turn. People were extremely unhappy. Everybody knew it for many years, and now the time has come to change it. And uh, if we see that these changes are undergoing in a very short time, it is because people need politicians to deliver. And in two years, there will be a second election, and this government will be really put on a trial. And one of the things which will be checked, it will be whether our judicial systems will work better in two years. That will be okay. real and fair trial. Thank you okay. very much. Thank you, Ambassador. All right. So now we got the other viewpoint as well, so that's good for the debate. I think you have your word cut, cut out for you. So in Holland, when you fall straight into you know, a real nice debate and you can get your point made, we say well, you're falling with your nose in the butter. You're very lucky. <laughs> so, yes. Hi, hello. Your uh, name is? David Valentek. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Amsterdam. And I work on um, economic sanctions, diplomatic sanctions. And um, I would like to talk about the point that uh, Professor Podorski raised in a great and, and uh, inspiring up lecture about the sanctions. Well, I'm a scientist, social scientist, and I uh, trust my data and I trust statistical methods. And uh, the data at the moment on sanctions indicates three things. They do not work. They, are, uh, they produce a rally around the flag effect, which means that support actually goes towards the leading party. and uh, they produce more income inequality and uh, hit hardest uh, the poorest through removal of investment and other you know, less trust on investor in a country that was hit by democratic or economic sanctions. This is the process. So if we want to introduce sanctions on Poland, the consequence can be that Exactly, it will these, these, they'll have the counter effect. It will yes. have not the right, right effect, but will have the counterfactual yes. effect and actually doing that. So the question is, do we want to punish the law and justice government? And if we want to punish them, then of course sanctions are the right tool. If we want to change their behavior and drive them into other direction. Well, empirics and social science would say sanctions are not the way to go. Yeah. And, and then the question is, what is the way to go? Carrots. <laughs> carrots. And what are the carrots? Okay, I, I see now everybody's getting excited. Can I just say that, because I'm going to take just one more question. The reason we are at the Bali is because there's a wonderful bar, and the whole point is that afterwards, everybody can well, engage in this dialogue this at, remark, at the bar. Know. Now, are you kidding? Nobody would have come here. So, yes, please. Uh, I would like to ask the why question. Uh, why is this ruling... I don't know too much about Poland. Why is the ruling party doing all these terrible measures, uh, how do they justify it? So what's really behind it to, to better understand it and what perhaps could be done? All right. Okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to add, add one last question and I'm just going to go around to, to our, our wonderful experts, which is that, and I don't know if you guys can answer that, but of course, being Dutch, I always wonder, could this happen here? You know, could this happen in any other country? It's happening in Hungary. Uh, we, have, uh, we have another session coming up about Turkey, which is not a member of the European Union, but could this happen in any country, in any European country? Uh, that's really what, uh, what the concern is. What are the kind of the lessons that, that we're learning from this? So who would like to, to respond first? Shall we go back to you for a second? Yeah? Yes, please. <laughs> we have seven minutes in total, everybody. <laughs> I'm going to have to be strict with you. <laughs> Just two points. One response to my friend Adam Charnot and one response to Mr. Ambassador. So Adam said, well, after all these eight years of uh, liberal governing, we at least have a government and the state which can steer 
the changes. So, Adam. Indeed, yes, that's true. We have a government which can decide about which theater play is to be privileged and which theater play is to be punished. We have a government which tries to have a law which will decide about which judges can be appointed and which cannot, because the National Council of Judiciary will be appointed by the parliamentary majority. We have a government which have dispensed with the meritocratic principles of civil service and which decides about who can be a civil servant or a general for that matter and who cannot be. And we have a government which without much <coughs> concern for various uh, international protests can decide about which trees in Białowieża can be cut down and which we cannot. And I grant you, yes, we in Poland now have the government which can do all these things. And you as a <clears throat> legal theorist and social theorist, you know very well how we call a government which can do all these things. We call it a totalitarian government, <laughs> right? A government which can do all these things about culture, about judges, about civil service, and about poor old trees and they can do all that, totally neglecting protests, is a totalitarian government. Congratulations. If that's what you like, fantastic. And one point, okay. And now one point to Mr. Ambassador. No, uh, maybe I have made myself unclear, and for this I, I apologize. I never wanted to say that the law and justice government is not legitimate to govern. And even though it came to power with 18% of eligible voters and with 36% of participating voters, because it got more votes than anyone else, it got strong plurality, it is allowed to govern. It is not allowed to govern along the lines, the winner takes all. It is not allowed to change Polish constitution because it didn't get that majority. It is not allowed to breach the Constitution in the morning, afternoon, and the evening because it didn't get, get that mandate from the people. So, you know, so you, so you, uh, when you think that according to law, well, it is enough that they get majority. It is enough, but it is enough for what? For governing within the bounds of the Constitution. It is not entitled and it never gets social legitimacy and mandate to undermine the Constitution by non-constitutional means. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Now I'm in a, in a dilemma because we have only two more minutes, but I know that there are probably a lot more people who want to reply, so I'm going to invite everybody to the bar, but I'm going to give you, because I, I think it makes sense, uh, you know, you had a very balanced, you didn't want to go black or white, and I would very much like to, very much like to end on some kind of positive note. What do we, what do, we do? What can we do? Uh, can we, we in Holland do anything? Should we leave this to the Polish people? Uh, is it right that, uh, that other judges get involved? Uh, what are the next steps? Uh, I think I'm not the best advisor, you know, uh, when it comes to what other nations sh should do. Uh, maybe showing the interest is already something important. But I would like to answer to Mr. Ambassador, if I may. Uh, because Mr. Ambassador was saying about um, uh, efficiency of the Polish justice based on the, um, on the statistics. The problem is that obviously the Polish judiciary needs reforms. Uh, we need reforms concerning uh, position of court experts, administration of courts, availability of assistants and court clerks, delivery of court uh, messages, uh, uh, use of the new technologies, and so on and so on. And so on a number of, I would say, boring structural uh, reforms that are needed for the Polish uh, judiciary. But somehow, I cannot understand why we start with exchanging judicial members of the National Council of Judiciary, because this is on the table these days. Second, uh, with the uh, shortening of the retirement age for the judges of the Supreme Court, which is also on the table uh, these days. Uh, I cannot believe that these are the most important uh, reforms for the efficiency of the judiciary. Second, uh, I have a feeling that they bring a threat to the independence of Polish courts. Thanks. Yeah. 
Thank you very much. So, so I feel I feel very bad about wrapping this up, but the deadlines are deadlines, and I there there is. Ja, volgens mij heeft de ambassadeur dat al hergezegd. Oké, oké. Ik heb al een Ja, ik I understand. We would love to have more voices in the debate. And I think we should definitely have an, have an open debate and we can continue that. I'm sorry that our time is up. I really want to thank everyone for taking the time to come here. There's very good Dutch gin at the bar. Uh, I know it's not as, as, as nice as, as some of the wonderful stuff I've had in Poland. I hope this will be only the beginning of a debate uh, and that we can keep on discussing this uh, as much as we can. I think the next uh, Dibali discussion is going to be on Turkey, if I'm not mistaken. Thank you all very much for coming and uh, I believe, Professor Sadorsky, that you owe the gentleman about the sanctions an answer so you guys can take a, make a little sanctions corner at the bar and see if you can work that out together. Thank you all very much. <laughs>